How St. Anne complied with the law of Moses in regard to childbirth and how Most Holy Mary acted in her infancy. It was a precept of the law given in the 12th chapter of Leviticus that a woman who had given birth to a daughter should be deemed impure for two weeks and should remain in the state of purification for 66 days after the birth. Just double the time required for purification in the case of a man-child. Having completed the days of her purification, she was to present herself in order to offer a lamb, one year old, as a holocaust for the daughter or the son, and also a young pigeon or turtle dove as atonement for the sin. This she was to do at the door of the tabernacle, beseeching the priest to offer them to the Lord and to pray for her. Thereupon she was accounted pure. The paturation of the most happy Anne was pure and undefiled, as befitting her heavenly daughter, in whose purity the mother was the sharer. Although on this account there was no need of a special purification, she nevertheless complied with the obligation of the law, to the very last point. Though not subject to its penalties, she considered herself bound in the eyes of men. Sixty days of the purification having passed, St. Anne departed for the temple, her mind inflamed with divine ardor, and bearing in her arms her blessed daughter and child. With the offerings prescribed by law and accompanied by innumerable angels, she betook herself to the gate of the temple and spoke with the high priest, who was none other than Simeon. He was accustomed to spend much time in the temple and enjoyed the privilege and favor of seeing the child Mary, not only when she was offered and presented to the Lord in the temple, but on other occasions. <coughs> Although this holy priest was not on each of these occasions fully aware of the dignity of our heavenly mistress, as I will say further on, yet he always experienced great promptings and impulses of the Spirit regarding the greatness of this child in the sight of God. St. Anne offered to him the lamb and the turtle dove with the rest of the gifts, and with tears of humility she asked him to pray for herself and the child, her daughter, that the Lord forgive them any fault of which perhaps they might be guilty. His Majesty certainly had nothing to forgive in a daughter and mother who were so full of grace. But he found himself bound to reward the humility with which, notwithstanding their holiness, they presented themselves as sinners. The holy priest received the oblation, and in his spirit he was inflamed and moved to extraordinary joy. <clears throat> Careful not to manifest anything exteriorly and communing with himself, he said, quote, what strange feeling is this within me? Are these women perhaps the parents of the Messiah who is to come? Unquote. Moved by this joyful suspense, he showed them great benevolence. The Blessed Mother Anne entered the temple, bearing her most holy daughter in her arms, and she offered her to the Lord with most devout and tender tears, for she alone, in all the world, knew what treasure was given into her charge. St. Anne renewed the vow which she had already made to offer her firstborn to the temple on arriving at the proper age. In renewing this offer, she was enlightened by new graces and promptings of the Most High, and in her heart she heard a secret voice urging her to fulfill this vow and to offer her child to the temple within three years. It was as, it was as if... It was, it was, as it were, the echo of the voice of the Most Holy Queen, who in her prayer touched the heart of God, in order that it might resound in the bosom of the mother. For when both entered the temple, the sweet child, seeing with her bodily eyes its grandeur and magnificence, dedicated to the worship and adoration of the divinity, experienced wonderful effects of the Spirit, and wished to prostrate herself in the temple, to kiss its floor, and adore the Lord. But as she could not execute these desires and external actions... She supplied the defect with interior fervor, and she adored the blessed Lord with a love more ardent and a humility more profound than ever before or ever after was possible to be rendered by any creature. Addressing the Lord in her heart, she offered the following prayer, quote, Most high and incomprehensible God, my King and my Lord, worthy of all glory and reverence, I, abject dust, but also a creature of thine, adore thee in this thy holy place and temple. I magnify and exalt thee on account of thy infinite being and perfections, and I give thanks in as far as my insignificance is worthy of thy regard. For thou hast vouchsafed to permit my eyes to see this holy temple and house of prayer, where thy holy prophets and my forefathers have worshipped and blessed thee, and where thy generous mercy 
has wrought so many wonders and mysteries in their behalf. Accept me, O Lord, in order that I may serve thee in this holy house according to thy blessed will. Unquote. Thus, she who was the queen of heaven and of the universe offered herself as if she were the lowest slave of the Lord. As a testimony of its acceptation by the Most High, a most resplendent light shone down from heaven, enveloping the mother and child and filling them with new splendors of grace. Again, St. Anne was made aware that she would be expected to, vote, to devote her daughter to the temple within three years. <clears throat> She was given to understand that the delight with which God looked forward to such an offer and the love with which the heavenly child desired its consummation would not permit a longer delay. The holy angels of her guard and innumerable others who were present on this occasion sang sweetest songs of praise to the author of these wonders, but they did not, therefore, have a more perfect knowledge of these happenings than St. Anne or her most holy daughter, who perceived interiorly what was spiritual and felt exteriorly what was subject to the senses in these things. St. Simeon saw dimly the sensible light. Thereupon, St. Anne, rich in her treasure and endowed with new gifts of the Most High God, returned to her home. <coughs> the ancient serpent eagerly observed all these events, yet the Lord concealed from him what he was not to know and permitted him to obtain knowledge only of what was necessary for his own undoing and his desire of destroying others and only so much as might serve to make him an instrument in the execution of the secret judgments of the Most High. This enemy was full of conjectures in regard to the unheard of things which had come to pass in connection with this mother and child. But when he saw that they brought offerings to the temple, and that they, like sinners, observed the pre prescriptions of the law, even begging of the priests to intercede for their forgiveness, he was deceived and assuaged in his fury, believing that this mother and daughter were of ordinary condition, although they might be more perfect and holy than other women. The sovereign child was treated like other children of her age. Her nourishment was of the usual kind, though less in quantity, and she, and so was her sleep, although her parents were solicitous that she take more sleep. She was not troublesome, nor did she ever cry for, more annoy for mere annoyance, as is done by other children, but she was most amiable and caused no trouble to anybody. That she did not act in this regard as other children caused no wonder, for she often wept and sighed, as far as her age and her dignity of queen and mistress would permit, for the sins of the world and for its redemption through the coming of the Savior. Ordinarily, she maintained, even in her infancy, a pleasant countenance, yet mixed with gravity and a peculiar majesty, never showing any childishness. She sometimes permitted herself to be caressed, though by a secret influence of a certain outward austerity, she knew how to repress the imperfections connected with such endearments. Her prudent mother Anne treated her child with incomparable solicitude and caressing tenderness. Also her father Joachim loved her as a father and as a saint, although he was ignorant of the mystery at that time. The child on its part showed a special love toward him as one whom she knew for her father, and one much beloved of God. Although she permitted more tender caresses from her father than from others, yet God inspired the father as well as all others with such an extraordinary reverence and modesty towards her whom he had chosen for his mother that even his pure and fatherly affection was outwardly manifested only with the greatest moderation and reserve. In all things the infant queen was most gracious, perfect, and admirable. Though she passed her infancy subject to the common laws of nature, yet this did not hinder the influx of grace. During her sleep, her interior acts of love and all other exercises of her faculties, which were not dependent on the exterior senses, were never interrupted. This special privilege is possible also in other creatures if the divine power confers it on them, but it is certain that in regard to her whom he had chosen as his mother and the queen of all creation, he extended this special favor beyond all previous and subsequent measure in other creatures and beyond the conception of any created mind. God spoke to Samuel and two other saints and prophets in their sleep, and to many he sent mysterious dreams and visions, or visions, Genesis 37, 5, 9. For to his omnipotence it is easy to enlighten the mind during the inactivity of the senses in natural sleep or during their ravishment in ecstasy, they ceased to act in the one as well as in the other, 
and without their activity the soul hears, accepts, and transacts the things of the spirit. <clears throat> This was the rule which the queen followed from the moment of her conception till now and for all eternity, for the activity of grace in her during her pilgrimage through life was not intermittent, like in other creatures. When she was alone or when she was laid to sleep, which was in her most, in her most moderate, she was engaged in the contemplation of the mysteries and the excellencies of the Most High and in the enjoyment of the divine visions and the conversation of His Majesty. Her intercourse with the angels was likewise very frequent, and in the following chapter something will be said of the manner of their manifestation and of some of their imminent perfections. My queen and heavenly lady, if without being offended, thou wilt, as a kind mother, listen to my ignorant talk, I will ask of thy kindness the solution of some doubts which have occurred to me in this chapter. If my ignorance and boldness should transgress the limits, instead of answering me, my mistress, correct me with maternal mercy. My doubt is, whether in this, in this thy infancy thou didst feel the necessities and hunger which according to the natural order children do feel. And if thou didst feel them, how didst thou, didst thou suffer these annoying inconveniences? And how didst thou ask for the nourishment and the other help necessary, since thou wast so wonderfully patient, and thou wouldst not make use of tears which serve other infants as speech and words? I am also ignorant whether the hardships of that age were not most irksome to thy majesty, such as to have thy virginal body clothed and unclothed, as infants are, to be fed with the food of other children, and to undergo the other experiences of that age, for other children undergo them bereft of reason, while nothing was concealed from thee, O lady. When I look upon thee as a child in age, and yet as grown up in thy capacity of judging of things, it seems to me almost impossible that there should have been no inconveniences in this matter, in the time or the measure, or in other circumstances regarding the treatment allotted to thee during thy infant life. Thy celestial prudence taught thee to preserve dignity and composure. <clears throat> yet thou didst not intimate the wants and needs of thy age and condition, either by crying as an infant or by word of mouth as one grown up. Thus they could not know thy needs and could not treat thee as one endowed with reason, for even thy mother could not know all these things, nor could she provide for all that was necessary, since she knew not the time nor the manner of serving thy majesty in all things. All these considerations excite my admiration and arouse in me the desire of knowing the mysteries thus concealed. Answer and instruction of the Queen of Heaven. My daughter, since thou art full of wonder, I will inform thee in all kindness. It is true that I was in possession of grace and of the use of reason from the first instant of my conception, as I have so often shown thee. I underwent the hardships of infancy as other children, and I regard, and I was reared and treated as others of the same condition. I felt hunger, thirst, sleepiness, and other infirmities of the body, and as a daughter of Adam I was subject to these accidental necessities, for it was just that I should in imitate my most holy son, who subjected himself to these hardships and defects, in order that he might merit so much the more, and in order that he might be an example to the rest of mortals for their imitation. <coughs> As I was governed by divine grace, I made use of eating and sleeping in moderation, allowing myself less than others, and only so much as was proper for the augmentation and the preservation of my life and health. Disorder in these things is not only against virtue, but against the well-being of nature itself, which is invaded and ravaged by it. On account of my exquisite composition, I was affected by hunger and thirst more painfully than other children, and the want of nourishment was more dangerous to me. But if it was given to me at unreasonable times or in excess, I bore it with patience, until by some befitting sign I could manifest my needs. I felt less the want of sleep on account of the opportunity which has furnished me for the presence of the heavenly conversation of the angels, which it furnished me for the presence of the heavenly conversation of the angels. That I was bound and wrapped in clothes was not painful to me, but it was a cause of much joy, for I understood by divine light that the incarnate Lord was to suffer a most cruel death, and was to be bound most shamefully. Whenever I was alone during my childhood, I placed myself in the form of a cross, praying in imitation of him, for I knew that my beloved was to die in that position, although I did not know then that the crucified was to be my son. 
and all the difficulties which I underwent after I was born into the world, I was resigned and contented, for I never lost sight of the one consideration which I desire thee always to keep in mind. It is this, that thou ponder in thy heart and in thy soul the truths which I saw, so that thou mayest form a correct judgment of all things, giving to each that esteem and value which is its due. In regard to this, the children of Adam are ordinarily full of error and blindness, but I desire that thou, my daughter, share it not with them. As soon as I was born into the world and made aware of the light which shone upon me, I felt the effects of the elements, the influence of the planets and of the stars, of the earth which sustained me, of the nourishments which preserved me, and of all the other things of this life. I gave thanks to the author of all things, acknowledging his works and benefits as benefits freely bestowed upon me, and not as dues which he owed to me. Therefore, when anything was wanting of the necessaries of life, I remained in peace and contentedness, and deemed it all perfectly reasonable and proper in my regard, since I had merited none of the gifts, and could justly be deprived of all of them. Hence, if I acknowledge this, thereby merely asserting a truth which the human reason cannot ignore or deny, where have mortals their intellect, or what use do they make of their understanding when, at the refusal of things which they desire, and of which perhaps they do not even profit, they begin to get sad and lash themselves into fury one against the other, and even against their God, as if they were suffering some injury at his hands? Let them inquire what treasures and riches they did possess before they came into life, what services had they rendered unto God in order to merit them. And if out of nothing there cannot arise anything, and if they could not merit the being which they have received, what obligation is there on the part of God to preserve out of justice what was given to them entirely, gratuitously? That God created man was of no benefit to himself, but to man it was a benefit, and one as great as the being given to him, and as high as the object for which it was given. <coughs> Excuse me. And if in his creation man becomes indebted so much that he can never pay his debt, Tell me, what right can he invoke at present for his preservation? He has, has he not received his being without merit, and many times forfeited it? How can he claim the guarantee and pledge of unfailing plenty? If the first transaction and operation was a mortgage and a debt by which man binds himself, how can he with such impatience demand favors? And if in, and if, in spite of all this, the supreme goodness of the Creator furnishes him graciously with what is necessary, why should he be agitated by the want of superfluities? Oh, my daughter, what an execrable disorder and what a despicable blindness of mortals is this! For that which the Lord gives them gratuitously, they do not thank him or even give him acknowledgment. And for that which he denies them justly and sometimes most mercifully, they are restless and profoundly desirous and proudly desirous, and they try to procure it by unjust and forbidden means throwing themselves into the very destruction which flies from them. The first sin alone committed by man was sufficient to cancel man's right to, be, to the friendly service of all of the other creatures. And if the Lord himself would not restrain them, they would turn in vengeance upon man and refuse to render any service or help for sustaining his life. The heavens would deny them their light and benign influences. The fire would refuse its heat. The air would cease to serve for respiration, and all the other things would in their particular way refuse their services, since they would in justice be bound to refuse them. Then when the earth would deny its fruits and the elements their moderation and their assistance, and all the other creatures would arm themselves to avenge the wrongs of their creator, perhaps disgraced man would humiliate himself in his vileness, and would not heap up the wrath of the Lord for the unerring day of accountants, when all, this, all his dreadful guilt will be exposed." But thou, my dear friend, fly from such base ingratitude, and humbly acknowledge that thou hast received thy being and life gratuitously, and that gratuitously its author preserves it for thee. Freely dost thou receive all the other benefits without any merit of thine, and thus, receiving much and repaying little, thou makest thyself daily less worthy of favors, while the liberality of the Most High grows continually with thy indebtedness. Let this thought be uppermost in thee always, in order that to it awaken and move thee to many acts of virtue. If any of the irrational creatures fail thee, I desire thee to rejoice in the Lord and give thanks to his majesty and bless them for their obedience to the Creator. If the rational creatures persecute thee, 
Love them with all thy heart, and regard them as the instruments of divine justice, which afford thee some opportunity of rendering satisfaction for thy deficiency. Rather strengthen and console thyself in labors, adversities, and tribulations, not only considering them as fully deserved by the faults committed, but deeming them ornaments of the soul and most rich jewels given thee by thy spouse. Let this be the answer to thy doubt. Over and above this, I wish to give thee an instruction which may be found in all the chapters. Consider, my soul, the punctuality of my mother Anne in fulfilling the precept of the law of the Lord, to whose majesty this solicitude was very pleasing. In this thou shouldest imitate her by observing inviolate each and every one of the precepts of thy rules and constitutions, for God will reward most liberally this fidelity and severely punish any negligence in this manner. Without sin I was conceived, and it was not necessary to present me to the priest in order that the Lord might purify me, nor was this necessary for my mother, since she was very holy. Nevertheless, we humbly obeyed the law, and thereby we merited great increase of virtue and grace. Despising just and wise laws and frequently dispensing with them destroys the worship and fear of God and fatally confuses government among men. Beware of easily dispensing in the obligations of the religious state, either for thyself or for others. If infirmity or some other just cause make it advisable, let it be done with moderation and with the approbation of the confessor, thus justifying dispensation before God and before men by the approbation of holy obedience. If thou findest thyself weary or weakened, do not at once become remiss in the strict observance for God will not give thee strength according to thy faith. I'm sorry. For God will give thee strength according to thy faith in Him. Do not give any dispensation dispensation on pretext of being overworked. Make that which is less serve and advance that which is gr the greater. Let the creature serve the Creator. On account of thy position as superioress, thou hast less excuse. Thou hast less excuse. For in the observation of the laws, thou must give a good example leading on to others. Therefore, for thyself, no merely human motive can serve as an, an excuse, though thou mayest sometimes excuse thy sisters and subjects on such account. Note, note moreover, my dearest, that I desire thee to lead in perfection. Therefore, this rigor is necessary, not even taking into consideration that the observance of the precepts is a duty to God and men. Let no one think that it is enough to fulfill all obligations toward the Lord, and at the same time tread underfoot the duty towards his neighbor, to whom is due good example and avoidance of all real scandal. O queen and mistress of all creation, would that I could attain the purity of the virtue of the supernal gifts in order that this inferior part of my being, which weighs down the soul, may prompt me to fulfill thy celestial teachings. I have become burdensome unto myself. Job 7.20 but with thy intercession and the gracious favor of the Most High, I will be able to obey thy will and his with a loving promptitude of heart. Let not thy intercession and support and the guidance of thy holy and wise counsels ever fail me. So, okay, so Mary speaking ended with uh, the this, this, this sentence, to whom is, good, is due good example and avoidance of all real scandal, and then, Bless Mary of Agreda starts with, O Queen and Mistress of all creation, would that I could attain to the purity, etc. Let's see. Of the emblems of the holy guardian angels in their intercourse with the with the blessed Mary and of their perfections. Excuse me. <clears throat> it has already been said that a thousand angels were appointed as guardians of Mary, just as there is one for each soul. On account of the great dignity of the most holy Mary, we must assume that each of the thousand guardian angels watched over Mary more solicitously, solicitously than other guardian angels watch over other souls. Besides these thousand angels who formed her ordinary and constant guard, many others were at her service on different occasions, especially after she had conceived in her womb the divine word incarnate. I have mentioned above that the selection of these thousand angels was made after the creation of the angelic hosts and after the justification of the good and fall of the bad. 
the divinity of the word, to be clothed in its human nature, and also his most pure mother, was proposed and manifested to them while they were yet in the state of probation. They were then made to understand that they were to revere them as their superiors. When the apostate angels were chastised and the faithful ones rewarded, the Lord proceeded according to a most just measure and equity. As I said, in the accidental reward there was a certain diversity among the angels according to the difference of their dispositions regarding the mysteries of the incarnate word and his most pure mother, which were made known to them before and during the probation. This accidental reward consisted especially in being selected to assist and serve the Most Holy Mary in the Incarnate Word, and also in the manner and form of their visible appearance to the Queen and of serving her. This is what I wish to explain in this chapter, but at the same time I must acknowledge my inability to do so, since it is difficult to reduce to material images and words the perfections and the operations of such exalted spiritual beings. Nevertheless, if I should pass over this matter in silence, I would fail to give a proper idea of a great portion of the most exalted operations of the Queen of Heaven during her mortal life. For next to her intercourse with the Lord and with his ministers, the angelic spirits was the most continual. For next to her intercourse with the Lord, that with his, with, with his ministers, the angelic spirits was the most continual. Therefore, without the mention of this intercourse, the history of her life would be defective. <clears throat> I presuppose all that I have until now said about the orders, hierarchies, and distinctions of the thousand angels of her guard, but I wish here to describe in what corporal forms they appear to their queen and mistress. The intellectual and imaginary apparitions I reserve for another chapter, where I intend to describe especially the different kinds of visions with which her highness was favored. The nine hundred angels that were chosen from the nine choirs, one hundred from each, were selected from the number of those who had distinguished themselves by their esteem, love, and reverence for the Most Holy Mary. They were made visible to the Blessed Virgin under the form of young men in their early years, but of the most exquisite beauty and courteousness. Their bodily forms showed but little resemblance to earthly matter, for they were transparently pure and like animated crystals bathed in glory similar to be glorified and to a glorified and transfigured body with their beauty they combined a grave and amiable composure their garments covered them in flowing folds but were resplendent like the most clear burnished gold enameled or stained with exquisite shades of color presenting a most wonderful and varied beauty to the sight at the same time all this ornament and visible presence seemed of such a kind that it could not be subject to the sense of feeling nor be touched by the hand although it could be seen and perceived like the rays of the sun entering into the open window and revealing the atoms of dust in the air. But the splendor of the angels was incomparably more beautiful and pleasing than any light of the sun. In addition, all these angels were crowned with wreaths woven of the most tender and exquisite flowers that sent forth the sweetest fragrance, not of this earth, but altogether spiritual and heavenly. In their hands they held palms of wonderful beauty and variety, which were to signify the virtues which Most Holy Mary was to exercise, and the victories which she was to gain by her sanctity and glory. All this they, as it were offered her beforehand, with all this they, all this they, as it were offered her beforehand, with great joy and jubilation. On their breasts they bore certain devices or emblems, such as were such as we are accustomed to see exhibited in the uniforms or habits of the military orders. They contain letters which stood for, quote, Mary, Mother of God, unquote, and which contributed much toward the splendor of their adornment and beauty. Their significance, however, was not made known to Mary until the moment of the incarnation of the Word. This emblem or device was most wonderful to behold on account of the great splendor with which it showed forth her name above all other beauty of the angelic ornaments. Its aspects and brilliance were changeable in order to indicate the variety of the mysteries and excellencies enclosed within that city of God. It contained the most exalted name and title, and intimated the highest dignity which ever can fall to the lot of a mere creature, that of Mother of God. In this title, the angels honored in the highest degree there and our Queen. They themselves were honored in that title, since it was the outward sign of their allegiance to her and of their 
preferment consequent upon their devotion and veneration for her who deserved the veneration of all creatures. A thousand times blessed were they to merit the especial love of Mary and her most holy son. <clears throat> the effects of this intercourse with the holy princess and of their outward beauty in Mary, our mistress, no one besides herself could ever properly describe. They manifested to her in a mysterious manner the greatness of the attributes of God, the blessings which he showered upon her in creating her and choosing her, in enriching her and endowing her with such great gifts of grace and treasures of the divine right hand, moving her and inciting her to such ecstasies of love and praise. All these gifts increased with her age and with the events of her life, and, as the great work of the Incarnation drew near, they expanded more and more, for then was gradually revealed to her the meaning of the emblem which these angels bore across their breasts which until then had been concealed from her. It would be impossible to describe what ardors of love, what profound humility, what tender affections filled the pure heart of Mary when this was revealed to her, and when it dawned upon her what dignity and what obligation toward God this most peerless title involved. For she herself, entirely incapable and unworthy of such an ineffable and mysterious dignity as that of the mother of God, the seventy seraphim who assisted the queen were of the number of those nearest to the throne of their god, who had most signally distinguished themselves in their devotion and admiration toward the hypostatic union of the divine and human nature in the person of the divine word. For as they were most closely bound to God by their greater knowledge and love, they also desired more earnestly that this mystery should be consummated in the womb of a woman. Their regard of essential and accidental glory corresponded to the particular and single love, this latter, the accidental glory, which I have mentioned, consisted in their being privileged especially to attend upon Most Holy Mary and to take part in the mysteries consummated in her. <clears throat> Whenever these seventy seraphim showed themselves to her in a visible manner, the queen saw them in the same form in which Isaiah saw them in imagination, with his, that is, with six wings, with two they covered the head, wishing to signify by this humble gesture the insufficiency of their intellect for the comprehension of the sacramental mystery at which they were assisting, and also their belief and acknowledgment of these mysteries, which they confessed prostrate before the majesty and grandeur of the Creator. Thereby they also wished to extol with its eternal praise the incomprehensible and sacred judgments of the Most High. With the other wings they covered the feet, which are the inferior extremities and closest contact with the earth, referring thereby to the queen and mistress of heaven and earth as being human and earthly in nature, and acknowledging her as the creator, I'm sorry, and acknowledging her as the creature, excelling all others in dignity and grandeur above all understanding and calculation of the created mind. Moreover, they thereby wish to show that though exalted as seraphim, they could not keep pace with the dignity and excellence of Mary. With the wings of their breasts they beat the air, or seemed to fly, thereby intimating two things. On one hand, by their incessant motion and flight, the love, the praise, and reverence which they gave to God. On the other, in disclosing their breasts, they wished to serve, as it were, to the most holy Mary as the most pure mirror of the divinity, reflecting its essence and operations to her during the time of her earthly pilgrimage, for it was not possible nor proper that the divinity should be manifest to her in open vision during all that time. The blessed trinity wished that their daughter and spouse should, in these seraphim, the creatures closest to the divinity and encircling the throne, see most faithfully presented in living images what she could not continually see in its own essence and in the original. By this means, the heavenly spouse enjoyed the portrait of her beloved, even in the banishment of her pilgrimage, being thus inflamed body and soul with his love, with his love by his vision and intercourse through these exalted and love-consumed princes. The manner of this intercourse over and above that which was sensible in it was the same as that which they maintained among themselves, namely, that those of a higher order enlightened, enlightened those of a lower, as I have said elsewhere. For although the Queen of Heaven was higher and greater in dignity and merit, yet as David intimated, Psalms 8, 6, on account of her human nature, she was lower than the angels. 
the ordinary manner of divine influence and enlightenment adapts itself to the conditions of nature and not of grace. The other twelve angels are the guardian angels of the twelve gates, of which St. John speaks in the twenty-first chapter of the Apocalypse, Apocalypse 21.12, as, as explained above. They distinguish themselves by the loving praise which they celebrated, with which they celebrated the goodness of God in becoming man to teach and converse with men, and next to their joy at the redemption of men and their readmission into the gates, readmission into the gates of heaven by his mercy merits was their loving wonder at the import important part sorry which most holy mary performed in this mystery of the redemption they were especially attentive to these great and wonderful works by which god was to open up heaven in order that men might enter into eternal life and this latter is signified by these twelve gates of the tribes of israel the reward of their signal devotion was that God appointed them as witnesses and, as it were, secretaries of the mysteries of the redemption, and that they were privileged to cooperate with the Queen of Heaven as Mother of Mercy and Mediatrix of those who turned to her for their salvation. Therefore, I said above that Her Majesty, the Queen, makes use especially of these twelve angels to assist, enlighten, and defend her clients in their, their necessities, and particularly in order to draw them from sin whenever they invoke them and the most holy mary oh that's so good to know <laughs> so good to know thank you lord god these twelve angels appeared in the same corporal shape as those which i have first mentioned except they bore palms and crowns reserved for the devout servants of the mistress their service consisted especially in bringing to her mind the ineffable kindness of the lord toward the human race hush kitty yes you hush my cat. Let's see him. There he is. He wants me to pet him all the time. See? <laughs> okay. These twelve angels appeared in the same corporal shape as those which I have first mentioned, except they bore palms and crowns reserved for the devout servants of the mistress. Their service consisted especially in bringing to her mind the ineffable kindness of the Lord toward the human race and in inciting her to praise him and petition him for the fulfillment of his mercy. She sent them as messengers of her prayers to the throne of the Eternal Father. They were sent also to those of, the, of her clients who invoked her or whom she wished to help and benefit in order to enlighten them and assist them as, they, as happened many times to the holy apostles for often did she aid them by the ministry of angels in their labors for the primitive church. Even now in our days, these twelve angels are engaged in the same ministry, helping the devout servants of their and our queen. Yay! The eighteen angels which completed the number of a thousand were those who signalized themselves in their compa compassion for the sufferings of the incarnate word. Their reward for this compassion was great. They appeared to Most Holy Mary in wonderful beauty, bearing many emblems of the Passion and of other mysteries of the Redemption, especially two crosses of the most refulgent splendor and beauty, one on their breast and one on their arms. The sight of this wonderful display excited great admiration in the Queen, a most tender and compassionate love toward the sufferings of the Redeemer of the world, and most fervent thanks and acknowledgment of the benefits which men were to receive in their redemption and rescue from cap captivity. The great princess very often sent these angels to our divine son with diverse messages and petitions on behalf of souls. In describing the forms and the ornaments of these angels, I have at the same time mentioned some of their perfections and operations, although necessarily in a limited way, if compared to the reality. For they are invisible rays of the divinity, most alert in their movements and operations, most powerful in strength, most penetrating in their understanding, incapable of mistake unchangeable in their condition and in their purpose, never forgetting or losing sight of that which they have undertaken. They are full of grace and glory without any fear of ever losing them. As they are without a body and invisible, therefore, whenever God wishes to grant to man the favor of being able to see them, they assume an aerial and apparent body, one that is adapted to the senses and to the object intended. All these angels of the Queen Mary were selected, from the most distinguished of their representative order or of their respective orders and choirs, their superiority consisting principally in that of grace and glory. 
They guarded their lady without neglecting the least point of their service during her holy life, and even now in heaven they derive an especial accidental enjoyment from her presence and company, although ordinarily only some of, some of them are sent to execute the special mandates of her will, yet all of them together are at times engaged in her service, fulfilling the decrees of the divinity in her regard. <clears throat> Instructions given to me by the Queen of Heaven My daughter, on three different points I wish to instruct thee in this chapter. The first is that thou, by incessant praise and acknowledgment, show thyself thankful, thankful for the favor which God's vow which God vouchsafed thee in appointing angels to assist thee, teach thee, and guide thee through the tribulations and sorrows. Mortals in their abominable ingratitude and grossness ordinarily forget this blessing. They do not consider what great mercy and condescension of the Most High it is to have ordained these holy princes as helpers, guardians, and defenders of men, their earthly fellow creatures so full of miseries and sins. In forgetting how exalted in glory, dignity, and beauty these spirits are, Many men deprive themselves of numerous blessings which they would otherwise obtain at the hands of these angels. Greatly do they rouse the indignation of the Lord on this account. Thou, however, my dearest, acknowledge these blessings and give him thanks with all thy heart. The second point is that thou, in every place and at all times, preserve love and reverence towards these holy spirits as if thou didst see them with thy corporal eyes, and that thou dare not do before them what thou wouldst not do in public. Cease not to exert thyself in this cease not to exert thyself in the service of God, even as they even as they do and as they require of thee. Remember that they continually see the face of God, Matthew eighteen ten, being of the blessed, since they at the same time see thee, let there be nothing indecent in thee. Show thyself grateful to them for their vigilance, defence, and protection. Let the third point be that thou live attentive to the calls, urgings, and aspirations by which these angels seek to rouse thee, move, and excite thee to recollection of the Most High, and to the exercise of all the virtues. Be mindful how often they have responded to thy calls, how often they have placed themselves in the way of thy seeking, how often they have solicited for thee signs of the love of the spouse, kindly reprehending thee for thy carelessness and remissions, remissness. When thou didst lose sight of when thou didst lose in thy troubles and weariness the guiding star of his light, they renewed hope in thy breast and patiently corrected thee, directing thy footsteps again into the narrow path of the, of the justifications and testimonies of the Lord. Do not forget, my soul, the greatness of the benefits bestowed upon thee in these angels, for they are above those of, any, of many nations and generations. Strive to be grateful to thy Lord and to the angels, his ministers. God bless you.